Welcome to Voice, Marin Voices and Views. I'm Larry Strick, working solo this segment. Peter B. Collins will be joining me later in the show when we speak to San Rafael City Councilman Mark Levine. My first guest is California Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones. Commissioner Jones was elected to office in November 2010. Interesting thing about his race and what was notable, the insurance industry spent about $5 million to try to stop him from becoming insurance commissioner. Prior to becoming insurance commissioner, Dave was a three-term California assembly member representing the 9th district, primarily Sacramento. While in the assembly, he was noted for championing the rights of consumers, being a force for affordable housing, protection for seniors and dependent adults, early education childhood, environmental protection, and sustainable cities. Dave is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government. He is married, has two children. His daughter, Isabel, is a budding singer who I had the pleasure of hearing at Dave's inauguration, and most recently, singing before about 2,000 people at the California Democratic State Convention. Welcome. It's great to be here with you and your viewers, Larry. And when she sang in front of the California Democratic Party Convention, you could imagine how proud I was as a dad, but also how nervous I was. The national anthem is a tough song to sing. I was scared for her. Uh, commissioner, the Commissioner of Insurance is the newest California constitutional office. Many people might not know exactly what it is. Can you describe how you see the Commissioner of Insurance of the State of California, and what is your vision uh, as Commissioner? My goal is to make the Department of Insurance the most important and successful consumer protection agency in California, if not the United States. Our primary mission is to regulate the insurance industry, and that includes all facets of the insurance industry, auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, other property insurance, casualty insurance, workers' compensation insurance, health insurance, you name it. Our authority to regulate varies by product. In some cases, we have more authority than in others. But the underlying principle is to protect consumers and protect businesses from a very economically and politically powerful industry that oftentimes takes advantage of people. I couldn't help but note when you took office, almost immediately before the ink was dry on the certificate, uh, you uh, issued an emergency regulation regarding loss ratios. Now, loss, I'm a lawyer. I don't even know exactly what a loss ratio is. What is it, and why was it so important to do on your first day? The regulation you described was a regulation giving me the authority to enforce a new provision of the Federal Affordable Care Act, which is what's called the Federal Health Care Reform Legislation. And what that provision provides is that 80 cents on the premium dollar of every premium dollar paid in the individual health insurance market has to go to actual health care, to physicians, to nurses, to clinicians, to clinics, to hospitals. You'd say to yourself, well, gee, why is that controversial? But in fact, it wasn't too long ago that Anthem Blue Cross of California only put about 60 cents on the premium dollar into health care. So moving that figure to 80 cents on the dollar is a big, big win in the Federal Affordable Health Care Reform Act. So I wanted to make sure that I had the authority to enforce that. That's why I issued the regulation. A loss ratio is the percentage of the premium that goes to actually pay claims. In this case, it's called the medical loss ratio because it's the percentage of the premium dollar that actually goes to pay health care claims. So, so, so essentially you're saying rather than paying dividends and profits and, and salaries to the insurance folks, put it into health care for people. That's exactly right. What this new federal law requires and what my regulation here in California requires is for individual health insurance products, 80 cents on every dollar collected has to go to actual health care. The insurers get to keep the other 20 cents. Now that sounds like a lot. And in fact, we are seeing uh, excessive profit taking, in my view. Uh, the five largest national health insurers made $11.7 billion in profits in 2010. That's a 51% increase over the money they made in 2008 at a time when we're still in the worst recession in the nation's history. So they're making a lot of money, there's no question. But at least by requiring that 80% of that in the individual health insurance market go to health care, we're putting more money into actual health care provision instead of insurer overhead and profits. And presumably they'll say, okay, have that MRI, rather than say not, because they have to do it now. Well, one thing that is a, is a driver of costs in the system is, unfortunately, there is some degree of inefficiency, waste, and even fraud. 
And so one of my responsibilities as the insurance commissioner is to go after and investigate fraud against insurance companies as well as fraud by insurance companies. I'm making it a big priority to go after medical provider fraud. And that's not just in the health insurance context, but also in the workers' compensation insurance context as well, where unfortunately there are some medical providers who engage in excess billing or phantom billing, and that adds cost to the system. It adds cost to us as consumers and as employers. On, on July 11th, the Obama administration rolled out its standard for insur mar insurance marketplaces that will allow families, small businesses, and individuals to shop for insurance, compare prices, uh, see what benefits they're going to get prior to buying coverage. That applies to California. That's being rolled out in California. Is that right? It does. And where are we on that process, and how do you see that coming out? We're a state that is moving forward uh, further and faster than other states. In fact, we're the first state in the nation to pass and have signed into law legislation to create a health benefits exchange, or this new marketplace, under the Affordable Care Act. The idea behind the health benefits exchange is that we take the 5.9 million Californians who currently do not have health insurance and we aggregate their buying power and use their buying power to get a better price from the health insurance. So rather than those individuals or those small employers being out there in the market by themselves where they are outgunned and outrun uh, by the insurance companies in terms of prices, by bringing those lives together we hope we can get a better price for them. That's what the health benefits exchange is about, and that's what these new Obama administration regulations are about, is providing guidance to the states on how to set that up. So we're moving ahead. We have a new health benefits exchange authority board that's been established. It's working to establish this exchange, and it'll be up and running by 2014. That's great. One of the things I don't understand about your job is that I understand the insurance commissioner has the authority to monitor rates for, for example, car insurance, homeowners policies, general liability policies but when it comes to health care policies you don't your authority does not extend is is there a problem with that and is there an effort afoot to try to give the insurance commission the authority to have uh, the ability to monitor health insurance rates yes to both questions good there is a problem and there's an effort afoot to fix it. The problem, and this surprises most Californians when they learn it, their insurance commissioner does not have the authority to reject excessive health insurance rate hikes. So these rate hikes that we keep reading about in the newspaper, whether it's Anthem Blue Cross or Blue Shield or Aetna or whomever, 10, 20, 30, 40, sometimes as high as a 90% cumulative annual rate increase. I don't have the authority to do anything about it other than to sentence the health insurer to my website. If I decide that the rate increase is unreasonable, I can put a little notice on my website, and that's the extent of my authority for health insurance. Now, as you point out, for auto insurance, for homeowners insurance, for all kinds of property insurance and casualty insurance, under a law called Proposition 103, which the voters passed in 1988, the insurance commissioner has had the authority to reject excessive rate hikes, and that law has worked really well. We've saved consumers and businesses tens of billions of dollars in premiums they otherwise would have had to pay for auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and other property insurance because of Prop 103, because of this authority. The insurance department and the insurance commissioner has been able to say, no, these rates are going up too much. We're going to require you to reduce them, modify them, or reject the rate increase outright. But I don't have that authority for health insurance, and my sister agency, the Department of Managed Healthcare, does not have that authority for HMOs. So the solution is to pass a bill that I'm sponsoring, Assembly Bill 52. It's co-authored by Marin's own Jared Huffman. A good guy. Well, a very good guy. A guest on our show several times. A very good guy, uh, and also Mike Fuhr of Los Angeles. And what this bill does is give me, the insurance commissioner, and the Department of Managed Health Care, which oversees HMOs, the authority to reject excessive rate hikes for health insurance and for HMO products. As you can imagine, huge fight. The health insurers and the HMOs are fighting tooth and nail to try to stop this legislation. Uh, every time there's a hearing, there's a line of lobbyists uh, out the door and around the hallway of insurance industry lobbyists lobbying against the bill. But we had a great outcome last week. We were able to move the bill from the Senate Health Committee. It now goes to the Senate Appropriations Committee in late August and then onto the Senate floor, with any luck, in early September. But we need people's help. Uh, if they believe it's a good idea to give the insurance commissioner the authority to say no to excessive rate hikes, contact state senators, in particular, 
contact Democratic state senators because unfortunately the Republicans are refusing to vote for it. So as it applies to the, to the guy on uh, the street in Mill Valley, like me, uh, you looking at the rates doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to disagree with an insurance company. You just want to see the, the the spreadsheet. Why do they need to earn this much money on their on their dollars? Is let me that give you a going? great let me give you a great give example. example. Certainly, in 2008, Anthem Blue Cross had an up to 39 percent rate hike that they proposed. It got a lot of public attention. It turned out they got the math wrong, and upon closer scrutiny. They had actually gotten the math wrong in the rate filing. They withdrew it with great embarrassment. So yes, definitely. We want to make sure the insurance commissioner and the Department of Managed Healthcare have the opportunity to review these rates and determine if they are justifiable. But we also want to make sure the rates are not excessive. And one of the things we look at in that regard is, is there excessive profit taking? Are there excessive administrative costs? These are all the sorts of things that we'll have a chance to look at. And in fact, uh, the top five largest national health insurers made $11.7 billion in profit in 2010. That's a 51% increase in profit over what they made in 2008. So there's huge profit taking going on in this industry. Anthem Blue Cross of California, just the California Anthem Blue Cross entity, made a 21% return on equity in 2010. So a lot of money is being made here at the expense of California consumers and California businesses. So I like the authority not only to just look at what's going on with those rates, but also say enough is enough, you're entitled to a reasonable profit, but not a 21% return at a time when everybody else is struggling. You hear every day in the newspaper, all over the place, budget, 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 there's no money to do anything. Does the budget problem impede your office from, uh, from it doing its investigation regarding fraud or taking a look at the pro uh, unjust profits that the insurance industry might be making? There's no question that I've been supportive of Governor Brown and the Democratic leadership of the legislature with regard to trying to resolve our budget difficulties. The sad news is that uh, Governor Brown and the Democrats proposed a balanced budget that included both cuts and revenues. Republicans rejected that. We ended up with an all-cuts budget. Thankfully, my budget is funded by regulatory fees on the insurance industry. So I am not subject to the ups and downs of the general fund. Right. And so we are able to be uh, robust in our regulation and robust in our protection of consumers because thankfully we haven't been hit with the same kind of cuts that other departments have been. You're about a year into your job. About a year into your job. Six months. So six months into your job. You've done so much. It seems like a year. Um, what are your goals for the for the for the remaining term? I have three major goals. One is the implementation of the Federal Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as health care reform. It's a big deal for California. It will allow more Californians to have access to health insurance at an affordable price, particularly if we pass Assembly Bill 52 and give me the authority to reject these excessive rate hikes. My second overarching goal is to make sure that the California Department of Insurance is the strongest consumer protection agency in the state of California as well as nationwide. And my third goal is to make sure that we have healthy insurance markets for all the insurance products that consumers and businesses need to ensure their activity. So those are the three overarching goals. We're doing a lot of work around health care, but we're also doing work to try to protect seniors. We're trying to make sure that the life insurance markets are functioning properly. We're looking very carefully at fraud and workers' compensation markets and a whole host of issues. But the underlying theme is consumer protection. Sounds like a guy who likes his job. You like being insurance commissioner? I am really blessed to get to do this. I feel every day I wake up, I'm excited about the prospect ahead. There's a lot of work to be done here, a lot of ways to make a positive difference in people's lives. When you think about it, everybody has insurance, and they oftentimes have five or six different kinds of insurance. It affects all of our lives, but there's also lots of opportunity for mischief, and that's where the insurance commissioner comes in to try to prevent that. Well, thank you for doing the work for us. On behalf of all Californians, I thank you. Dave Jones, California Insurance Commissioner, thanks for coming for, to Marin Voices and Views. Thanks, Larry. Great to have a chance to spend some time with you and your viewers. San Rafael City Councilman Mark B. Levine joins us today. He was elected to his first term in November 2009. Recently, he was elected vice chair of the Marin Telecommunications Agency, which oversees the Marin Community Media Center right here, where we originate this program. He also serves on the board of MarinKids.org, which adv advocates for children in Marin. 
He is an executive at Beyond Lucid Technologies, a healthcare information technology startup. Mark earned a bachelor's in political science from Cal State Northridge and a master's in national security affairs from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Mark lives in Sun Valley here in San Rafael with his wife Wendy and their two children. Mark, welcome. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Now, you've been on the council for a year and a half during a time of budget cuts and tough decisions like the target controversy. How do you like the job and what do you think you've contributed to the San Rafael City Council? The job's fantastic. It's been an enormously challenging time, but equally rewarding. And I learned this as soon as I started campaigning for it, where I got to know so many more people in our community. Um, and as I walk into any store or down the street and realize that I know more people and they know, know me, that it becomes smaller. Um, it feels as though you actually know the people that you live in town with, and uh, you can never make up for that experience. It's been a blessing. Um, as far as how to run a city, that challenge has been uh, at times overwhelming, but you know we've got really great people here that want to see the city succeed, um, and you know we have a strong community uh, when we are able to come together um, and see the city forward at a time where it's challenging for us, but so much more challenging for many other communities across California uh, that we're actually in a, a much more fortunate place than, mm -hmm. than many others. In your own role, how do you see the way you fit in with the four elected members and the directly uh, elected mayor? We're all co-workers and it's interesting to me we're having an election in November where a mayor uh, who's been here for 24 years is retiring and uh, we have one of the council members who wants to run for mayor that you know, I could conceivably have one or two or possibly even three new coworkers. So while a normal resident, you know, even myself, thinks, well, I'd like to elect someone good, from my perspective, I want to elect someone with a temperament that I can actually work well with because we're grappling with difficult issues. We're not always going to agree, but you want to be able to have honest discussion and really you know, forcefully argue uh, with someone but know that you're going to walk away and still be friends and want to work with them again. Um, and so that perspective on the election is, is a new one that I didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. You voted in favor of the proposal to cite the Target store in East San Rafael. And I know that was controversial and there was a lot of pressure from, from a lot of folks uh, asking for, you, for your consideration. How did you decide to, to support that? We're, ta we're, store. we're talking about a neighborhood that has 15,000 people, over a quarter of the city's population, that has only one full service market, but nowhere to buy back to school clothes. 30 liquor licenses, but no pharmacy, um, no you know, neighborhood bank. Um, and so you're looking at a city, or a corner of the city, that has very, uh, very few services for its residences. And for, for this business in particular, the PTA presidents of the two elementary schools served by that neighborhood said, this is a store our families need. And I know, for example, at Bahia Vista Elementary School, we've got about 100 families on their food pantry program receiving free food on a weekly basis. They do need a store where they can shop locally, and you know they've already been mode shifted out of cars. It's a heavily walking community uh, that they can actually get to easily uh, to shop at. But there are enormous benefits that came with this as well. When I'm talking with leaders throughout the state, uh, one assembly member who, when they were on a city council in LA or in Southern California, was amazed that we were able to carve out apprenticeship jobs for our local building trades unions. Um, I spoke with someone from the League of Conservation Voters that was wowed that we have a first in the state renewable portfolio standard requirement that this project meets uh, the clean energy targets of, uh, of the state 20% presently and a, a third by 2020. There's no condition like that anywhere else in the state of California. We have a first here in San Rafael for that. So we have enormous environmental wins, good wins for our neighborhood that need these services and opportunities, um, and jobs as well. So it's, been a, it's going to be a very positive thing. And to think that uh, we'll be able to attract people to come to San Rafael in a part of the city that most people don't even realize is there um, I think is going to be positive for San Rafael as well. The mayor, uh, Al Boro, uh, was quoted or made a comment that said that he felt that the debate was driven by uh, ideology 
and not substance, I suspect. Do you agree with that, or where, where do you come in on his comments regarding how the vote went down? Sure, he made those comments about 1 a.m. <laughs> after a meeting <laughs> that started at 6 p.m. Okay. And maybe 30 or 40 minutes before he made those comments, I made mine when I said the very best part of this entire proceeding was how the community felt welcome to share their thoughts on this, both for and against, and I still stand by that. Uh, when you hear from community members how they see their city, what they want in their city, whether they're for or against an issue, the fact that they feel welcome to come to City Hall and share those thoughts with us is, is powerful and positive, uh, and I welcome it. And, uh, and so I, I you know, would take a different position uh, on that experience. Mark, over at 3rd and Irwin, we have these red light cameras, $500 a pop. Most of the people who violate have just made an incomplete stop. They're not, you know, ramming their car through the intersection at 30 miles an hour on a solid red light. Uh, do you support the red light cameras? Uh, L.A. is getting rid of them, and uh, I'd like to see that happen here. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, issue to deal with. First of all, we have to make sure that it's legal for us to be using these cameras to, to take pictures of drivers, and there are some court challenges on them right now. So I'm following them. I know our, our law enforcement is, is following that uh, as, as well. Um, I also want to make sure people, when they enter our city, drive safely. And so, to be quite honest, if people run red lights, I don't feel too bad for them. Um, but I don't want to be getting people, when they're rolling through at uh, an inch of a mile uh, or an inch a, an hour, um, thinking that we're welcoming them the proper way. Um, so, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing it properly. We have lengthened the yellow lights. I think that's a good thing. We're not being dishonest, shortening yellow lights and trying to increase fee revenue. And in fact, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is so many of the fees from our traffic tickets and even our parking tickets get sucked up to the state and don't stay local at all. Uh, and so we have to be very careful whether we're actually doing something that's positive for the city or in fact annoying a lot of people just to benefit uh, the state. And, and the intersection there in particular is two one-way streets. Mm -hmm. So it's permissible to turn left off of uh, Irwin onto 3rd on a red light. And in rush hour, I imagine there are some people who are trying to keep the traffic flowing and just go with that flow and they don't make a complete stop. But in your view, is that the same as intentionally running a red light? I don't know. I haven't seen the data on that. Have you gotten a few tickets? No. Peter, I have Peter has tickets. an interest in this issue. <laughs> I have Why? zero <laughs> tickets. This is it's an issue of, of entrapment and uh, the unfairness of the $500 fine, the fact that it doesn't come back to our community, and that we're basically taxing a group of people who just get snagged. I, I think it's, it's, it's bad all the way around, and it produces uh, bad attitudes toward law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to a different note, okay? <laughs> uh, we've, we've, this, we've, I'm stopping with the stoplight issue here. Um, we had a fellow on uh, last month or the month before, Mike Shapiro, who wants to bring minor league baseball to Albert Park. Uh, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think athletic activities on the park uh, are good, and uh, we're going to be having a boxing match even at Albert Park in September. And the idea is we're going to have a, a venue where people are going to come and see athletics on that field. I haven't seen the proposal for baseball. Um, I look forward to, to reading it and seeing what the impacts on the city might be, both positive and negative. Um, but I can see uh, neighborhood concerns that they might have about regularly scheduled games that go late into the night, uh, as well as some of the positive impacts that the city would experience with people being drawn to Fourth Street uh, to, to shop and eat prior to or after a game. I'll be walking next Tuesday morning with a neighbor uh, around Albert Park just to kind of see from his perspective what his concerns are. Um, I'm at Albert Park twice a day, and my son goes to preschool on that property. And uh, so I am familiar with it. And the, the neighbor of the park who wants to walk with me, his grandson, goes to school with my son. And I'm looking forward to that walk and getting his, uh, you know, neighborhood perspective on, on what that experience will be for him. Mm -hmm. Mark, you're frequently mentioned uh, as a possible candidate to succeed Jared Huffman, who is termed out as our member of the assembly. Uh, do you think you'll run? Well, I, I have formed an exploratory committee. I've been uh, receiving encouragement to run. We have tremendously challenging issues facing the state of California. 
we do need a fresh perspective in 2012. We've been very well served by Jared. Um, and I think everyone in the state is looking at and to see who's going to be solving our problems. There's far too much at stake to sit by the sidelines. Uh, so we have to be involved in making sure we have a good representative uh, in 2012 for sure. You know, that race is likely to attract eight, nine, ten. I think last time 11 people ran in the, in the primary. Um, do you feel that you have a natural constituency in the, in the district and who might those folks be? And if you have one, how do you expand and, and win a race like that with so much competition? Well, I've been elected twice to represent the 6th Assembly District on the Executive Board of the California Democratic Party. So my natural constituency includes grassroots Democrats from as far north as Sonoma or Pengrove uh, to Bodega Bay all the way down to Sausalito. Um, and so I, I think many people know me from throughout the, the Sonoma Marin District. Um, and it's a matter of sharing uh, my perspective, who I am, the values I'll bring with me to Sacramento if I choose to do this, um, and to make sure that they know who I am, to make sure I cut a above uh, the other candidates. But I expect a lot of people to run, and I welcome many candidates to get into the race um, and have a, a very hearty debate about the issues impacting our district and all of California. Just time for a brief answer. Why would you want to go to Sacramento with the budget deficits and the dysfunction there? No, I think that's the right question to ask. Um, you have to wonder how much pain you want to take in um, and deal with. And I think it's, it's a little bit about how much is at risk for California. And you know, it, it's part of what got me involved in local government and the city council. I've seen the weeds encroaching upon the sandbox in our city parks. I know what's at stake as I see the, the demands on our city services. And this is impacting us at the state level where we could see state parks close, where tuition continues to increase at our universities, uh, where services are being cut left and right. And so everything's at risk. I'm raising my children here in a state that I've loved and lived in all my life. And if you think you have the perspective um, to improve on this state, sometimes you have to get out of your seat and actually do something about it. Mark Levine, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for coming.